So uh, today I had prepared, or this week I should say, I had prepared all week to teach on um, this, the subject of remembering, and I've just gotten lost in the Word. For those of you who have regular habits of studying the Scriptures, I know you know what I'm talking about, where you just sort of get lost in all of the connections. And I kept feeling like God was leading me down this road uh, to teach, um, to give, I think, what was an important message um, for our community. Uh, and the more I got into it, the more I felt like I need to spend more time on this talk. I think there's something important here for us, something really timely uh, that I don't just want to share before it's actually ready, which left me um, with what I thought was going to be a moment of making like a Hail Mary phone call to a friend uh, just to come and teach this Sunday. Uh, and then there was this sort of subtle nudge from God to build off of last week's message uh, which where we started talking about the wilderness in Deuteronomy 8 for the season of Lent, uh, and that there was something here t- in, in this brief message today that would actually prepare us what I feel like God is preparing me for to give um, next week. So I'll give that setup for you. We're going to jump right in here. Um, and we wanna, I want to go back, actually, kind of right to where we left things off last Sunday. So let me pray for us, and then uh, we will jump in. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Um, God, we give you thanks this morning as people just made in your image, dearly loved, saved, rescued, delivered, set on the path of life, adopted. Um, Lord, we, we give you thanks, Lord, for your grace and your mercy and for the joy that it is to walk with you. God, I pray uh, with the words that, um, I've prepared and the passages we're going to look like, Lord, that you would do something, um, that your spirit would just move in our midst, even as we're scattered about. I think of every friend uh, in dorm rooms and on couches at dinner tables. Um, some people I know love to go down to the beach and watch it on their phone as the waves roll in. Lord, wherever we are scattered about, kids like jumping all over us and barely able to focus, uh, Lord, we... Uh, Um, We want to come in this moment with faith, with expectancy, Lord, that you would move. So as we pray uh, week after week, Lord, give us open eyes and ears and hearts to hear you, to see you, to allow you to convict, um, to encourage, and and to move us, Lord, closer to who you've created us to be. Um, So we thank you, God, for the sacred time that we have together. In your name we pray. Amen. So Deuteronomy 8, uh, we're in the season of Lent, week three of Lent. By the way, if you did not uh, pick up a Lent guide, there's a digital Lent guide that's on our uh, Lent site. Just go to lent.church. Uh, there's still, what do we have, uh, a few more weeks left of Lent to snap into a regular rhythm uh, and some practices and scripture readings that we've put together, just a way to bring us into alignment as we go through this season. And we're focusing on the subject of the wilderness, both looking at uh, this, this Hebrew tribe, in the wilderness and looking at the spiritual wilderness uh, that we find ourselves in and the cultural wilderness that we find ourselves in and all these different overlapping pieces. So I want to start in Deuteronomy 8 and then actually jump to the New Testament for a little bit. We read last week, be careful. So this is Moses uh, speaking to this Hebrew tribe, preparing them uh, to take what they had learned in the wilderness as they're about to head into the promised land. It says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness those 40, these 40 years uh, to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. So he's referencing back to the story and an example of testing. Uh, He says then in verse six, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. This is the word of the Lord. These people who had this divine calling so for those of you brand new to the scripture, these Hebrew people have been given uh, this, this powerful, beautiful, you know, world-altering calling to be a different kind of tribe in the world. 
And we need some different sorts of tribes in the world, do we not right now? This one existed for the benefit of its non-members. It was called out and blessed in order to be a blessing to all the nations. This was a sacred vocation. So in slavery, when they were in Egypt, um, we, we read they began to forget sort of who they were. They get worn down by this cultural, culture of oppression that they've been in. Uh, their worth uh, is coming from what they do for Pharaoh, how much they produce, um, the hope that they have in the Lord, their faithfulness to God, for many of them at least, is just being slowly beaten out of them. And then God, which by the way is the story of so many of us, right? It's like this was happening and then God, and then God, and then God steps in. God rescues them, saves them by grace alone. There was nothing that they did to deserve that rescue, which is a whole other sermon. God takes them out of Egypt, out of bondage, and then into the wilderness, where God then begins to undo how they had been formed in slavery and prepare them for their future. God took them out of Egypt and now God was going to take Egypt out of them. This is by and large what's happening here in the wilderness. Testing and training is how you remove the formation of slavery and death that they experienced in Egypt. So we led with this question last week. What might God be wanting to take out of you this Lent? Is there an invitation for you to training and to testing? Take a moment just to consider that. Like what, what is God doing? What if you were able to like listen in last week and take some time to reflect with us? What is God looking to undo, to take out of you? Taking the Egypt out of these Hebrew slaves is about reuniting them with, with their maker, which will reunite them with each other, which will reunite them with the land, which will reunite them with their calling. This is all about being reformed and reunited with themselves. God loves them enough to save them and then right, loves them enough to father them, to walk with them, to discipline them, to reveal what was really in their heart. God is longing to not just hear them say, you alone are God, you are our father, you are the way, the truth, and the life, but to see it, to step deeper into faith, like real life, living, breathing, blood and guts, faith and dependence. There is this term in the New Testament in the letters written to the very first churches that comes up again and again that helps us see the intensity and passion and resolve that comes from people who are having Egypt taken out of them, who are being realigned and who are resisting the cultural pull of death and slavery, which is simply life outside of God. Or at least if you're here and a follower of Jesus, you believe that's life outside of God. And this term is doulos in the Greek, or bondservant, bondservant. We read this in a few places in the scriptures. One is in Romans 1. I just want to do a little survey here. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. we read, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, so this is beginning his letter. He's setting things up. The beginning and ending of a letter is critical to frame what Paul is trying to do for this church, this new outpost of love and grace and of the way of Jesus in the city of Rome. Here it's Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. We read in Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. We read in James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings, servant, slave. Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1. we read, uh, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. There's the phrase again, servant, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude 
1 1. Jude, underrated book. Jude, a bondservant, same word translated here, bondservant, for a number of reasons, of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God and Father, and uh, preserved in Christ Jesus. And then the passage that I want to spend the most time in here today is 1 Corinthians 7. We read 7.22, for the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. 2 Timothy 2.4 reads, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. The Lord's servant. This word servant, bondservant, slave, this word doulos, uh, can be translated or defined one who is subservient to and entirely at the disposal of his or her master. Interesting. I think it's safe to conclude that these writers want followers of Jesus to understand themselves, at least in part, in this way, with this word, over and over and over again. The term doulos is used at least 40 times in the New Testament. Uh, to refer to the believer. And the Hebrew equivalent is used over 250 times to to, uh, refer to the faithful in the Old Testament. In these passages, you have every writer going on, like every one of those writers, if we were to take time in each one of those letters, going on to make the case for Jesus being God in flesh and blood, Jesus announcing the way of heaven here and now, making statements about joining and partnering with God and the work that he's doing in the world. And above all, these writers are explaining to these different new church communities and outposts of the kingdom, explaining to them how Jesus is king, which is the good news and thus he is to be the center of your life he is showing us Jesus is showing us what it is to be human and by the way he is not like one of many messiahs or one of many Christs like he is the one the template the form so acknowledging that he is at the center of all creation means to make Jesus king of your life And all of the followers of Jesus out there went, amen, yeah, of course. This means that you see yourself as under the authority of Jesus, which means we're saying things like his way is the best possible way. Now in saying all of that, why, even for some of us who are Jesus followers, does this feel a bit strange? Or why for some of us is there like a tension that rises up in us? Why hearing, um, hopefully you think of, of me and our like teachers and pastoral staff and leaders as like as nuanced and wanting to help people understand this and uh, understand the faith. Hearing something just so point blank. Why, what is it, why does it do something uh, to many of us when we hear it? I think it's sort of simple. To say Jesus is Lord is to say, Jesus, you have the right to tell me how to live. And our current cultural moment like has properly taught us to be skeptical about final claims to absolute truth that are proclaimed by any sort of authority. Um, Like especially an authority that that seems to wanna keep us in some sort of control. This attitude has been completely like fuzzied into a license to believe whatever you like without feeling any obligation to conform your views to what is actually true or possibly truth. I think it's safe to say that our culture is on a quest for liberation from God, but not just from God, like from authority, which produces, and we've seen this time and again, a sort of self-defining autonomy. The self becomes ultimate. The self becomes God. We're driven by individual passion alone rather than by a shared understanding of character and of virtue. Eternity is nothing more than the quality of our current lives. We try to jam all of eternity into a current moment. And so our pursuit of freedom is endless. We want freedom from nature. We got that early on. 
We want freedom from our own nature and freedom from our own biology and freedom from our own wants. And we want freedom from any sort of want and we want freedom from authority. And that's what I want to focus on for a few minutes. Freedom from authority. We believe no one has the right, or at least culturally, I think this is in the air, that we believe no one has the right to tell us what to do. We're free from authority, which means it's the individual against everything else. So as a result, we live in a culture when, um, where when you are trying to tell everybody that the goal of your life is to take all of these areas of your life and submit them to the lordship of Jesus, other people hearing that, this idea of I want to gather up all of these things of who I am and submit them to God's way, most people don't have a plausibility structure for that. Like, th that's not a plausible idea. There's no structure for how that would even happen when the whole of life is freedom from claims of a person like Jesus. There's this deep cultural conflict. Jesus is Lord of all versus nobody has the right to be Lord of anything but me. I am Lord versus Jesus is Lord. And there's this tension that I think we all feel on some level between these two things. Do you feel that? Do you feel that in your own heart? Do you feel some sense of just being internally, internally torn? Because this seductive and compelling narrative that's coming at us from every conceivable cultural angle is, is discipling us, is forming us. So if as a follower of Jesus, and I know not all those listening right near followers of Jesus, this already sounds a bit intense and a bit too much. I understand that. But if as a Christian, stay with me, by the way, if you would trust me on this journey. <laughs> if as a Christian, the goal is to throw off any sort of authority and be your authentic self, the concept of self-denial, the idea of Lent seems like spiritual insanity. We have been carefully conditioned to worship ourselves instead of worshiping the creator who made us in his image, who defined life and defined love and defined joy. The key word here is designed. Just, that's the only difference. In, well, there's a lot, I guess, but the fundamental difference we're talking about between the follower of Jesus and someone who's not is simply a belief that there is a design and a way design this is important important when we want to choose another design the dominant question in our cultural moment is what do we want and how do we feel when the more important and life-giving and electric question is who are we and why are we here so all of these writers paul james peter all of these new followers of jesus they see themselves as a bondservant, as a slave, as a servant. They see themselves, as Paul writes, bought with a price, freed from death, and now a bondservant of God, of Jesus, just like the Hebrews rescued from Egypt. So a couple things. What does it mean to be a bondservant? or a slave in a biblical sense. Five just really quick parallels between the way of Jesus and a first century bondservant. The first is exclusive ownership. If you're taking notes, just write exclusive ownership. Bondservants are owned by their masters. Uh, Paul says to believers really, really clearly in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 to 20, he says, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. Apparently, we are not the masters of our own fate. We're not the captains of our own soul, at least according to the Christian story, the Judeo-Christian story. We were bought with a price, and so we belong to the one who has paid the price. We can choose to acknowledge this and live into this or not. There's freedom and then an invitation for us, right, to come and to follow. Number two, we read uh, in this passage in 1 Corinthians, verse 20, we read the word, therefore, Paul says in verse 20, because you were bought with a price and are not your own, glorify God in your body. So exclusive ownership implies complete submission. If we belong to Christ, then the rule of our lives is not our will, but his. 
To master the art of living is to follow the master, the author of this life. Third, there is singular devotion. Number three, singular devotion. No bond servant concerned himself with obeying other masters. Their chief concern was carrying out the will of the one they belong to. Jesus writes in Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. Um, the 19th century evangelist, George Mueller, uh, he captured the spirit of being a bond servant to Christ beautifully when he wrote this. He wrote, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died, died to George Mueller and his opinions and preferences and tastes and will died to the world its approval or censure died to the approval or blame of even my brethren and friends so the bond servant of jesus is singularly devoted for the bond servant is also marked by a total dependence this comes up right again and again in the Exodus narrative, completely dependent on his master for the provision of the basic necessities of life and of something deeper, that spiritual, those spiritual necessities. In the same way, a follower of Jesus is invited to humbly depend upon the generosity of the master. Like it says in Matthew 5 and 1 Peter 4. And because God is loving and kind all our needs are met and we are then free to serve him unhindered and with joy. All right, lastly, five. The slave, the bondservant, was personally accountable, personally accountable to the master, which is something we don't talk really honestly enough about. Jesus is the one to whom we will answer, the one to whom we will give an account There is no like, oh, like spiritualizing or playing games with this texts like this. Like we are going to give an account not to different Christs and different messiahs and different like spiritualities and different forces and different like ways of like trying to interact with whatever, but to Jesus. And that reality will have bearing on how we conduct ourselves now. So to be a Christian is simply to say, I want to follow the master, that I believe that Jesus is the way. Like Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I've come to give you life, life to the full, life more abundantly. I love this transliteration. Eugene Peterson in the message says, uh, he transliterates Jesus' words as saying, I have come that you might have more and more better life than they ever dreamed of. This is true. Then why would I not bind myself to that? If that's true, if that abundant life is true, why would I not choose like allegiance to that? Why would I not open myself up to testing and to training? Some of you, your story, your story is God, you've shown me your love. You have shown me that I am loved at the deepest parts of my being, that I don't need to fear death, that I have a calling and a purpose. For so many of you, you can say, God, you have taken me out of Egypt. And now the prayer is, Lord, take Egypt out of me. Take the individualism out of me. Take the despair out of me. Take the nationalism out of me. Take the racism out of me. Take the gossip and judgmentalism and promiscuity and lying and fear and joylessness out of me. So in John 8, when Jesus says, you will know the truth if you adhere to my teachings, 
I mean, you, we could extrapolate on that. Like if you would adhere to my testing and my training and who have called you to be in the path I've called you to walk, if you do this, you'll know the truth and that truth will set you free. Jesus is not simply inviting people to know some things in their head. He's inviting us to live in such a way that we experience the living God and the life of heaven here. The first believers were known because as they embodied this posture of a bond servant, they began to live a certain way. That's actually what this group of Jesus followers were called initially by outsiders. Outsiders called this movement followers of the way. Those people, those are the followers of the way. I want to read you something I've read before years ago. Um, and it fires me up every time I read it. And I was putting this message together and I pulled this up. I found myself again just moved by this letter. It was written, um, I'm not exactly sure, but as early as like 23 years after the Apostle Paul, uh, who wrote many of the letters, again, we've just been referencing, after he died. The author is unknown, but it was written to a, a man named Diognetus, or Diognetus. I've heard it pronounced like eight different ways over the years. Uh, likely a Roman elite. So the writer, who is a follower of Jesus, is explaining to an outsider why the way of Jesus, why Christianity is spreading so fast, why so many are pledging allegiance to Jesus instead of Caesar. And he writes, they buy themselves, they busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They live in their own native lands, but live as aliens. They marry and have children, but do not kill unwanted babies. They share their table with everyone, but not their bed. They love everyone, but are persecuted by all. They are poor and make many rich. They are short of everything, yet have plenty of everything. They are treated outrageously, but teach others respectfully. When they do good, they are attacked. When they are attacked, they rejoice as if given new life. The first followers of Jesus were known because they lived a certain way. When they get together, they share their, they share their stuff and they care for people and they celebrate. They follow a different path. And that path begins with trusting who God says that they already are and living into that. So when these writers say, I'm a bond servant, I'm a slave to Christ, the picture, the picture that you get in your mind should not be of someone who is reluctantly serving the master or bound to a demanding, guilting, shaming, overbearing father, but of someone whose will, whose will is over time with training and testing and wooing, with grace and with mercy, choosing to lovingly and happily obey the master's will. Theologian Alexander McLaren called it uh, the blending and absorption of my own will in his will. So it's not just I do what he wants, not what I want, but as he teaches me, and shows me more of himself, what I want conforms. Hear that word, conforms to what he wants. One last passage before we close. Turn with me to Exodus 21. Exodus 21 puts us back in the wilderness and promised land stories, brings us back to this Hebrew tribe. The Hebrew word uh, for bondservant, ebed, uh, has a similar connotation to doulos, that Greek word for bondservant. The law allowed an indentured servant to become a bondservant actually voluntarily. So we, we read here, uh, if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges he shall take him to the door or the doorpost and then pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be a servant for life. 
for example, I'm so tempted right now to tell like an ear piercing story. I'm going to save you. <laughs> for example, in those days, poverty stricken Hebrews would sometimes sell themselves into the service of a slave to their fellow Hebrews to pay off a debt that they might owe. You follow me? But they also knew that one day, they would be set free again because God's law for them stated that each slave was to be treated fairly and that they were to be released at the end of the sixth year of slavery, fulfilling their debt. Now, some slaves developed an unbelievable relationship and were treated so well by their master that they realized that their quality of life was actually better being a slave, being a bondservant in a bed than a master. And since they were so grateful, when it was time to be released, they opted to remain in slavery to their master. They would then give up all of their rights permanently and continue to submit to their masters willingly. They were known as a bond slave. This would be openly proclaimed in public by the piercing of their ear. It's like um, what I thought was life and what I thought was freedom actually isn't. It's like this allegiance to God at first, or especially in a season like Lent, right? For some of us who just sort of pop into church a bit and we love being a part of this community, but uh, like there, there's, a, there's a distance there. It's like at first, like following God or listening to a sermon like this, if you've hung on this long, it seems confining and it seems restricting and it seems difficult. But actually, the more and more I'm here, the more I lean in, the more I allow God to test and to train and to sort and to refine, the more Egypt is taken out of me, the more I find myself conformed to the patterns of life, like capital L life, and the way that it was meant to be lived. Like it says in Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Sanctuary. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, his creation, his sculpture, his poetry, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for the mitzvah, for caring for the, home, the fatherless and the widow and the foreigner, joining God in the renewal of all of this, all of these good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord Jesus, I uh, just had this like flashback as I was about to pray to uh, those moments in my life, like the last night of summer camp or night at youth group or seeing friends the first time they got exposed to the Jesus message. I keep getting these images of like recommitting committing for the first time and recommitting again to you, recognizing my propensity, just like the Hebrews in the wilderness, to forget, to not trust. To not like proclaim you and declare you Lord over all of my life, just the convenient parts. 
And I just, I imagine there's many of us from those that have been walking with the Lord for so long to those that um, yeah, aren't and aren't sure what it means to take the next step with Jesus. That there is like a, a conviction welling up. That there is, um, that your spirit, Lord, might be inviting some of us uh, to take whatever the next step is toward um, It's like a, 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 a full surrender and submission to you. It's like even this archaic little picture that we just spent time in of like the piercing of the ear. Like many of us, like we, we know in our heart and we do like we, we want to trust actually that your way is the best way. And yet there are just these corners of our heart that we're just not interested in you like stepping into and shining a light on. Or for some of us, Lord, maybe there's just a, a general apathy that kind of hovers over our life right now. Like there is this sort of sense of that's, that's, that's just too much. I'd rather go back to the meals in Egypt, at least in slavery, we didn't have all of this like trying and testing. At least it was that. Lord Jesus, I just, um, I pray, Lord Holy Spirit, I pray would you move mightily in this day, in this moment as we head to communion. As we come to the table, Lord, and remember your forgiveness and grace, Lord, would you move powerfully in revealing the places where we need to allow you to take the Egypt out of us. All the places where we're content, but you're not content with where we are. For Lord, we long to know the depths of your joy and your love and your freedom and your grace and to flourish with you. And so Lord, on this like halfway point through Lent, I pray that you would maybe crystallize for some of us the things that you're inviting us to take a look at. And to invite, Lord, your merciful and graceful healing hand, Lord, on those things. That as we kind of pivot here into the last part of land with Easter on the horizon, with resurrection and new life and celebration of the promised land on the horizon, Lord, that we would allow you to prepare, prepare us, God, that we would do the work, Lord, in Congress with your spirit, in partnership with your spirit, to become more free and more alive and more awake to the good and the true and the beautiful. Thank you, God, in advance for the work that you are doing and will do. I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.